Hello, and welcome to this course on the Book of Daniel and Apocalyptic Literature. My name is David De Silva, and it is my privilege to be your guide for this semester through this intriguing uh, genre of Jewish religious texts from the period generally between uh, the two Testaments. In this course, we will look at um, Daniel, of course, specifically, but we will do so in the context of the uh, larger sampling of Jewish literature that resembles Daniel, that genre that has come to be known as apocalyptic literature. Um, and this will help us in a number of ways uh, to kind of get a larger frame of reference for evaluating how Daniel is composed, what its conventions are, and how to understand them, uh, and uh, to get at what the author of the book of Daniel, particularly the visions of Daniel, um, is uh, seeking to accomplish by addressing his hearers not with such direct exhortation, but rather with visions of of uh, the rise and falls of empires and worldly powers uh, rather uh, colorfully uh, depicted rather than in typical historical jargon um, and uh, by drawing their attention to the activity of a larger world beyond that which can be seen. There are um, many approaches to reading Daniel out there it is certainly less prominent than its uh, New Testament relative, the book of Revelation, which uh, of course in turn depends a lot on Daniel and uses Daniel extensively. Um, nevertheless, one of the, uh, in fact, the first way that I myself was introduced to the book of Daniel was as a young teenager in conversation with my Seventh-day Adventist grand-aunt, uh, who, uh, who very much enjoyed the fact that even at such an age I was very interested in scripture, and kept me supplied with a continuous line of, uh, of uh, small tracts and larger books offering interpretations of both Daniel and Revelation. And of course, in these interpretations, uh, Daniel uh, was a book that took in its predictive scope everything from the Babylonian Empire uh, to our present day and the forthcoming future. Uh, and in the, uh, in the course of that, uh, it was particularly the fourth beast, uh, poor fourth beast, who was uh, stretched uh, thin enough that uh, the details uh, of that beast description could cover everything from the rise of the Roman Republic uh, through, the, um, through the conversion of the Roman Empire under Constantine, the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the various descendants of the Roman Empire, uh, and still uh, uh, reach in scope to the present day. Uh, I learned uh, a little bit later in life, maybe uh, in my early 30s, late 20s, uh, that there were other approaches to Daniel, which took the details of its, uh, of its text equally seriously, but did so uh, within a very different frame of reference. Uh, and so uh, the differences between what I would say is a more popular reading, certainly not just Seventh-day Adventist, but very popular out there amongst uh, uh, groups that read and focus on biblical prophecy, per se. Uh, a great difference between that reading and uh, readings, say, offered by critical scholars who are very much interested in thinking about Daniel in terms of its original setting, at whatever that is, and what uh, the author of that text was trying to achieve amongst God's people in that original setting. And these ways uh, differ based on a number of factors. For example, uh, one's decisions about the genre of Daniel or related texts. Is it indeed prophecy as prediction foretelling the future? Or is it more unveiling, 
apocalypse, which is simply the Greek word for lifting a veil from something, hence unveiling or revelation. Um, and uh, the, the different interpretations uh, stem from different ways of thinking about ancient conventions of authorship and writing. So uh, do we take the authorship of Daniel at face value and uh, read every word in these uh, 12 chapters, or perhaps uh, 12 chapters plus the additions to Daniel, if, uh, if you are committed to the Roman Catholic and Orthodox forms of Daniel, do we read all of that as uh, having been written from the Babylonian exile uh, during the reigns of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, uh, Darius, and Cyrus? Or do we read the book in the context of the conventions of certainly other apocalypses, where the author, the actual author, has not given uh, his or her actual name, but has rather linked his or her text to a prominent, important, uh, faithful figure of uh, Israel's history. Um, so, for example, when we read First Enoch, uh, it is very rare that someone will, will insist that uh, the claim to authorship by Enoch is in fact genuine. Um, unless the scroll was put in a really well-constructed bottle uh, to survive the flood. Rather, it's generally accepted without much uh, difficulty that First Enoch is pseudepigraphic, the fancy word for uh, attributed to someone who is not really the actual author of the book. Um, uh, similar things would be said about 4th Ezra, 2nd Baruch, uh, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, and the like. And because these books are not canonical, um, uh, there are very few ideological barriers to talking about pseudepigraphy. So, again, it makes a huge difference, then, if you take Daniel as the historical author of these twelve chapters, or if you understand the book to have been written using the ancient convention of pseudepigraphy uh, as a way of identifying the uh, the message, particularly of Daniel seven to twelve, with this um, with this notable, faithful um, figure celebrated in Israel's history. And a third difference in interpretation, I think, frankly, comes from levels of historical awareness. Um, uh, people who are, in particular, um, uh, committed to the Protestant canon of Scripture, tend to have a rather shaky grasp of history in the period from Alexander the Great to the rise of Rome. Uh, we seek to really care about history in the uh, post-exilic period, meaning the Persian period, the time of Persians dom Persia's domination of, of Judea, and only pick up historical interest again pretty much uh, with the reign of Augustus, uh, the first historical, the earliest historical figure, uh, I think, named in the New Testament. But particularly for Christian communions who are committed to a broader canon, uh, the canon that includes what Protestants call the Old Testament Apocrypha, for such people, interest in history, to the extent that, that people are interested in history, very naturally includes the period between the Testaments, uh, with hardly any gap. Um, and, and so the more one knows about the Seleucid and Ptolemaic kingdoms and their interactions uh, and the actions of particular uh, monarchs from the Hellenistic period, uh, especially from Antiochus uh, III on, the more it becomes possible to read Daniel's uh, uh, prophecies, the, the, chap the last six chapters of the book, um, in terms of uh, already accomplished events, uh, such that, in effect, the book really stops speaking round about 166 BCE. Um, and, and it is among those who really are very fuzzy on anything that happens after Alexander uh, that jump then to the Roman Empire 
as the next and most uh, reasonable landing point for, um, for thinking about the fourth beast. So, uh, so there are these very different schools of thought uh, about how to make sense of Daniel, and both schools of thought, um, I think it just has to be said, are very committed to the text and to taking the text in all of its details very seriously. The goal of this course is not really to convince you of the correctness of one view or the other. It is chiefly uh, to provide us with a forum of exploring these and, and other views uh, as, as critically, which means as evaluatively, as investigatively uh, as possible, um, and to broaden our knowledge base, our base of, of questioning and, and our critical thinking framework uh, to adjudicate these various positions uh, as best as we can, uh, down to the presuppositions that uh, dispose one more toward one solution uh, over the other. Uh, and on the basis of that, to figure out where, at the end of the semester, we are uh, going to position ourselves in regard to our interpretation of this book, our proclamation of this book, and our use of this book in the formation of Christian disciples and Christian communities to the extent that God has uh, given us that opportunity to speak into and, uh, and help shape the lives of others. Uh, to this end, in this uh, video, I want briefly to recap some of the uh, uh, focal points of the syllabus. Um, I do take for granted uh, that you all will read the syllabus very closely and even refer to it throughout the course uh, to, uh, of course, uh, to make sure that you're doing the assignments week by week as outlined there, uh, but also to keep before your eyes the expectations of the course, the other components uh, beyond the reading, and what have you. And at the outset, I just want to, to highlight what this course is trying to achieve uh, in terms of your own formation as educated Christian leaders. There are a number of learning outcomes on the first page of the syllabus, um, uh, the first two of which uh, are very much interested in, um, in helping you or making sure that you're listening to Daniel in terms of the way ancient readers, uh, uh, perhaps the first readers for whom the book was written, um, are thinking about the book and hearing the book, uh, and, and particularly to increase your knowledge of the history of the post-Persian period to an extent that you can uh, reasonably judge the degree to which Daniel is concerned with the history, the events, the challenges facing uh, the people of God during that period. And I should just say on that point, um, uh, even those who ascribe, uh, who subscribe to uh, Danielic authorship of the visions of chapter 7 through 12 can also ascribe to the um, the premise that the book is written specifically uh, to assist Jews facing the challenges of the pre-Maccabean period, the, uh, the, uh, the time of the Hellenistic reform and the repression of Judaism that eventuated in, in grisly martyrdoms and uh, really jeopardized the existence of Judaism as a faith and witness in about 168 through 166 BCE. Um, so to immerse you, one of the first goals of the course is to immerse you in that uh, historical, cultural, ideological context so that you can think about this book um, on the basis of, of all of that knowledge. Also, um, to uh, immerse you in generic and literary conventions, uh, such as apocalyptic literature. Uh, if we read Daniel against the background of these other texts that I'm going to set before you, 
as opposed to thinking of it strictly as predictive prophecy. How does that change our, uh, our, our interpretation of the text, our appropriation of the text, um, and, and our understanding of what its author is trying to do? Um, and uh, on the basis of this broader knowledge base, uh, to uh, position you all to critique and evaluate the various interpretative approaches to Daniel, uh, including your own, whatever that is. Because, um, again, um, between my position now and the position of my now deceased Seventh-day Adventist aunt, both of our positions uh, are quite capable of being critiqued, adjudicated, uh, sharpened, um, and having evidence uh, brought forward to, uh, to um, uh, encourage us to re-examine our positions. I want for all of you who are uh, taking this course to be thus equipped to uh, question, evaluate, refine your own position and also the positions of those whom you will read or encounter in the course of your ministry. Uh, another uh, related goal to this is um, much more skill-based and, and not limited to our thinking about Daniel, and that is simply uh, to, um, to help you grow in your exegetical skills and your hermeneutical instincts, uh, so that at the end of this course you are able to apply the uh, many uh, facets of the ATS model of exegesis better than you could before you started the course. So our, our hope is through our work together, through our performing exegesis on multiple texts, including Daniel, at the end of the course your own exegetical paper will reflect growth in your uh, facility in the exegetical process, both the science and the art, the uh, creative instincts of biblical interpretation. Now, Daniel is, is, a, is a different sort of text from some other uh, Old and New Testament texts in that uh, there are a lot of spiritual disciplines exhibited in the narrative of Daniel itself and also in the uh, narrative frames of the visions. Um, so, being very interested in spiritual formation myself and in spiritual disciplines and, and, and what have you, traditional liturgical spirituality, it, it occurs to me that we will want to be attentive throughout the course to look at what spiritual disciplines Daniel and his companions, his fellow Judean exiles who are similarly well-placed in the Gentile court as he is, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, what disciplines they engage, under what circumstances, to what end, with what consequences, and think about uh, ways in which, really, Daniel can contribute uh, to our, um, our personal spiritual disciplines and even um, our, our encouragement of communal spiritual disciplines or group uh, engagement in spiritual disciplines. And then, of course, there is a, an element in which this course invites us to a larger reflection uh, on, on the, um, the reading of Daniel and the theological application of Daniel. Uh, so, for example, Daniel um, had a significant history of impact on Jewish literature. Uh, its imprint can be clearly and explicitly seen in books like 4th Ezra and Revelation, uh, a little uh, less explicitly in books like 2nd Baruch. Josephus actually even refers to Daniel, even though he doesn't write Apocalypses himself, he does talk about the interpretation of Daniel in his circles in the first century AD. Uh, so we will look at um, uh, not just texts that potentially influenced Daniel, uh, but also Daniel's history of influence. Oh, I forgot, very importantly, the parables of Enoch, um, uh, perhaps written in the early first century AD, and also Jesus' traditions, uh, talking about the Son of Man, uh, or the so-called synoptic apocalypse, Jesus' apocalyptic discourse in Mark 13, very clearly show uh, uh, the ongoing impact of Daniel um, 
on first century Judean thought and expectation. So we want to give attention in, in that regard to the history of reception of Daniel because it continues to inform New Testament interpretation. Uh, and also then um, to talk about, in a way that integrates our historical work, our exegetical work, with our modern uh, ecclesiastical contexts, uh, to talk about the application of Daniel, the formational potential of Daniel, uh, both its uh, the ways it can contribute and challenges, frankly, to um, to uh, how it might contribute, or what gets in the way of applying Daniel, in other words, in your own ministry context. So we want to be attentive to these goals uh, throughout the course and make sure uh, that what we're reading, what we're uh, viewing, what we're talking about uh, keeps uh, positioning us to attain these. Uh, a quick word about the required texts. Um, I, have, I have chosen two commentaries to be our primary guides during the week, sorry, the weeks that we are dealing with Daniel. Um, those are commentaries by John Goldengay and Tremper Longman. Uh, both of these gentlemen, I think, would describe themselves uh, as, well, certainly as people of faith, but even people of evangelical faith. But what's very interesting to me about, uh, about the two of them is that Goldengay uh, regards uh, Daniel as pseudepigraphic, as a text written by an anonymous Jew living in... Um, in the pre-Maccabean period, about 166 BC, uh, gathering tales about Daniel that present uh, powerful, important models that are informative for the challenges, for Jews facing the challenges of 166 to 166, sorry, 168 to 166 BC, and then formulates those visions during that period to encourage Jews to remain faithful to the covenant in the face of of increasingly hostile and repressive measures. Tremper Longman reads Daniel uh, as written uh, by the historical Daniel in its uh, virtually in its entirety. Um, and, and so we have two um, fabulously trained and highly accomplished Old Testament scholars um, who cannot be differentiated on the basis of their uh, their faith or their commitment to Christian uh, uh, belief and practice in the church, um, taking the two very different views of the book right there. So I think uh, the counterpoint between the two of them throughout the course will, will help us to continue to both honor and question uh, uh, both approaches to uh, thinking about the composition of the book and then the third text by John Collins, who, you know, if, if any person is the dean of apocalyptic literature and its study, it would be John Collins. Um, and so he has this book uh, now in its revised edition called The Apocalyptic Imagination, which is a, a good introductory textbook uh, to the genre and to virtually all of the samples of this genre. So we will keep dipping into this book um, as our, <clears throat> our primary textbook uh, when we're reading First Enoch, Testament of Levi, and all these other uh, extra canonical apocalyptic texts. And of course he also has uh, a chapter there on Daniel. Um, he has gone on since then to write um, a, a massive commentary on Daniel for the Hermeneia series which, of course, would represent the most mature fruit of his work on the book of Daniel. Uh, I didn't assign that uh, because I think Golden Gay uh, presents a very similar case, but in a way that, well, uh, to start that sentence again, Golden Gay and Longman are, are ideologically much closer together than Collins and Longman would be. And I, I want us very much to avoid the impression that the view of Daniel as pseudepigraphic is liberal, and the view of Daniel as historically written by 
you know, the Daniel of Babylon, uh, of the Babylonian exile, is conservative or evangelical, because that's just simply not the case. The other thing is Colin's commentary being in the Hermeneia series is, you know, it reads like stereo instructions. So it would be a tough, it would be a tough haul to, uh, to read it uh, in its entirety. Am I not merciful? Now, alongside the secondary uh, texts, really our, our main readings are the primary texts, and these three uh, assigned textbooks are just going to help us uh, get into them. Um, and during the course of this semester, um, I will I have you all read two major portions of First Enoch, First Enoch 1 through 36, and then First Enoch, I think it's 83 to 108. So we will, we will skip some portions uh, in the earlier part of the course and focus on those which tend to be regarded as uh, at least containing uh, the earlier portions of First Enoch. Perhaps our earliest example, then, of Jewish apocalyptic literature. Um, and also we'll read the Testament of Levi, which is one of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, a collection of, of Jewish texts reworked by Christian scribes, in fact, preserved uh, uh, by Christian scribes rather than by the Jewish community independently. Uh, the Testament of Levi is the, is the most apocalyptic of those 12 testaments, including a, an otherworldly journey, uh, in effect, of Levi uh, to the very throne of God, as well as a kind of uh, uh, predictions of the course of history leading up to the coming of the uh, of, of a messianic priest uh, and then of course we'll read Daniel itself and in conjunction with Daniel uh, and its history we'll want to read or I'll want you to read uh, first and second Maccabees two books of the Apocrypha or two books included in the Old Testament of our Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox sisters and brothers because these are essentially the historical books that cover the period with which Daniel, uh, irrespective of when Daniel is composed, uh, seems most to be concerned, and with which its, uh, its predictions seem to match up most closely and intimately. Then we'll look um, on the other side of, of working through Daniel in its entirety, which is basically the middle six weeks uh, of the course, we'll look at uh, texts on which Daniel has exercised a significant influence, hence the synoptic apocalypse, uh, fourth Ezra and second Baruch, and Revelation, three apocalypses, two of them Jewish, one Jewish Christian, written at, uh, toward the end of the first century AD, all of them after the first revolt and the destruction of Jerusalem. And to some extent, in the case of 4th Ezra and 2nd Baruch, far greater extent, uh, reacting to the aftermath of, of that cataclysmic event for Jewish consciousness. Now, <clears throat> I expect you all to have ready access to Daniel, the Synoptic Apocalypse, and Revelation, but I understand that uh, many of you may not have the others sitting on your shelves. So I have provided in the syllabus a number of web links uh, where you can find these texts either read them online or download them. Um, uh, of course, you can find 1st and 2nd Maccabees and 4th Ezra in the Apocrypha. If you happen to have a study Bible like the Oxford Annotated Study Bible or the HarperCollins Study Bible or the Common English Bible Study Bible, you'll find those three books there. Um, but 2nd Baruch, 1st Enoch, Testament of Levi are all... Uh, generally printed among the pseudepigrapha, and not everyone has that sitting on their shelves. So you have links in the syllabus, and also try to uh, put links up on the angel course uh, for your ease of use um, down the road. There will be uh, some other readings beyond these, uh, but I will supply all of those, in fact I already have, uh, in, in the form of PDF files. Uh, in folders on the angel course uh, in the weeks for which they are to be read. Thus, for example, if you look at your syllabus um, and, and look at the reading assignments for week one, 
you will find the following four assignments. I am asking you to read uh, always some primary texts, some ancient texts. So for this first week, 2 Kings 24 to 25 and 2 Chronicles 36, uh, <clears throat> a record of the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem. Um, and then I'm asking you to read 1st and 2nd Maccabees, and I think I may... Nope, uh, I, I may have specified uh, some chapters there uh, within that. Uh, the, the most important chapters to read would be 1st Maccabees, uh, say, 1 through 3, and then 2nd Maccabees, 1 through 7 or 1 through 8. Uh, those are the ones that that will give you the best historical background into the period of 175 to uh, 164 BCE. And then there are no readings for week one from the three um, uh, required textbooks, but there are two readings which are basically overviews of the period. One from my book, uh, uh, Introducing the Apocrypha, and one from another excellent commentary on Daniel, by Lewis Hartman and Alexander D. Lella uh, in the Anchor Bible, now known as the Yale Anchor Bible series. But these pages, uh, both readings I have Xeroxed, scanned, created PDFs out of, and posted on Angels. So you'll find them right now in the Week 1 folder if you wish to uh, download them and uh, print them off to read or simply read them online another sample set of reading assignments just so you can decipher my uh, my intentions clearly looking ahead to week five I'm asking you to read the entirety uh, Daniel in its entirety and then there are now uh, assignments from Longman's commentary and Golden Gaze commentary and then this assignment from Collins that is simply Collins with a comma and then page numbers would be from Collins the apocalyptic imagination your third required textbook then there are two additional readings, one from Stephen Miller's commentary on Daniel, which prevents, uh, sorry, presents a very uh, conservative argument in favor of the traditional authorship. And then uh, uh, two segments from John Collins' Hermeneia commentary on Daniel, uh, presenting uh, the other case, uh, the case for the other position, uh, even more uh, forthrightly, I, I would say, than you would find in, in Golden Gay. Uh, so these two that are marked with parentheses Angel, you can download from Angel and then you'll have all the readings for week five uh, at your fingertips. Now there'll be some other uh, aspects to this course other than reading, obviously. Um, many weeks, perhaps not all, but certainly most weeks, you can expect to find lectures posted online. Uh, I will be recording these much as I am doing this, and because of my location, I'm in Florida now, incidentally, uh, where I've moved because my wife is from here, and uh, I gave her 19 years to get used to the cold and cloudiness of Ohio, and she has convinced me that she's not going to. So we had an opportunity to come down here, uh, where she hopefully will flourish again. Uh, so, uh, because of the technology I'm able to use, I can't have media sites down here, I will be using YouTube uh, to host uh, all of my videos. Uh, and there will be links then in the Angel course uh, to YouTube videos. Um, <clears throat> uh, one thing I have found myself here using Angel is that uh, the link function doesn't actually work for me. I don't know if that's some problem I'm having with my browser and its add-ons, so many things could go wrong, uh, or if that's now an angel-wide issue. So I am always now posting the actual uh, web address of the link um, also, so that you don't even have to click on anything. Uh, you can just copy uh, that link, that web address, and then paste it into a new window and go directly to the uh, YouTube lecture that way. Um, hopefully the link, clicking on the link, will simply work for you because that's the easiest way to go. But if not, remember the copy and paste of the web address that will be displayed right there 
on the angel page, uh, uh, on the, um, the icon uh, and, and the description talking about each lecture or presentation. I'm going to uh, ask you all to write a few essays over the course of the semester. This certainly won't be a weekly thing, uh, but uh, we will try to do it um, a number of times, uh, at, least, at least six, perhaps as many as eight, in the course of the semester. These aren't going to be burdensome uh, assignments, I, I trust, maybe three-page assignments, two or three-page assignments. Um, to process some of the uh, issues that we're dealing with in the readings and the presentations. And I'm going to ask these to be posted uh, uh, online. I'll create discussion forums uh, for you to do that in the weeks when essays are due. And that way you can read and respond to each other's essays as well. And this will be an important way for, uh, for us to sharpen one another instead of for all of you simply to rely on my input, uh, but uh, rather to, to rely on one another as well. And again, not necessarily every week, I will uh, post some discussion forums with some focal points for conversation and engagement one with another. This will be then something less formal than the essay, uh, the essay uh, discussion forums. Um, but uh, for an online class, this is really our means of experiencing a community of learning. Um, and, uh, and so I would encourage you all to engage those when they come up as fully and wholeheartedly as possible. Um, the final component, of course, is an exegetical paper. Uh, you recall one of our objectives is for all of us to grow ever more in the range of skills uh, contained in the ATS model of exegesis, uh, which is available from the seminary website, but I also have it um, in our course shell um, under sort of the, the initial course materials, course orientation. Uh, so you should refer to the ATS model of exegesis, and I would suggest uh, that you, you think early on in the course about that passage in Daniel about which you wish to write and uh, spend some time every week then thinking about that passage um, uh, under a different light uh, as you know the, the ATS model of exegesis may line out uh, 12 different kinds of lenses I can't remember the exact number offhand um, and, and, and the model of exegesis is full of questions to pose of a text uh, questions that the text itself might answer if you engage in close observations, questions that commentaries on the text uh, may answer because these scholars have done so much of the spade work uh, for us. Uh, so I, I would strongly encourage you to begin that process early in the semester so that you can really enjoy the journey of digging into that passage and exploring it uh, through all those um, all those facets of investigation contained in the ATS model of exegesis. Uh, and then, of course, when we get to actually writing the paper, uh, you can present a well-integrated exposition of that passage um, on the basis of having lived with it long and really uh, ferreted out by that point what the helpful uh, observations and insights have been and um, and what has merely proven to be busy work that didn't really lead uh, to gems of insights as it were. Um, the, bi the bibliography and I don't really mean the bibliography I, I really mean the footnotes or the endnotes must show um, uh, energetic engagement with a minimum of three scholarly critical commentaries. And you're reading two of them anyway, so this shouldn't be terribly burdensome. Golden Gay and, and Longman both count. If you were to get Collins's commentary as the third, you're all set in that regard, or, or Lewis uh, Hartman and Alexander Delella's commentary. And then also uh, a minimum of three uh, additional resources. Those could be other 
uh, uh, critical commentaries if you wish, or they could just be uh, scholarly articles on a particular question about Daniel, uh, relevant for the passage that you're uh, exegeting, or someone's uh, dissertation or other book that takes you deeper into um, some facet of Daniel and its context and its interpretation than a commentary is able to do. Um, so uh, the idea being um, the work that has been done by scholars on Daniel can greatly enhance your exegetical engagement of, of the text. Uh, and, and the people who have devoted decades into writing a commentary uh, can do a lot for you that you cannot do in one semester of exploring the passage yourself. So engage those resources, choose them well, and, and uh, benefit from the work of others. Uh, this is all now in the syllabus, of course, but um, just so we're clear, when I read your papers, I'm going to be looking for four things. And these four things, you know, some of them hide 20 things, but the, the four basic headings are, you know, uh, is this informed by the kinds of exercises and kinds of examination laid out in the ATS model of exegesis uh, as appropriate for the passage. Some passages don't call for some kinds of analysis, so that will become clear as you try it uh, and you find out, hey, there is absolutely no intertexture in this passage whatsoever. It's completely original, so uh, thinking about the sources on which the author has drawn is getting me nowhere. That can happen. Um, but does, does the paper show evidence of having worked through all the appropriate sets of questions and skills in the model. Um, does it engage primary and secondary literature appropriately uh, in the process of discovery, uh, of investigation, um, of the questions that you need to be asking of your passage in order to really understand it and therefore be able to communicate its meaning to others, in the case, to me, in your paper. Um, I'm looking for a clearly written logically coherent paper. I don't take those for granted. Rather, I rejoice uh, when I get a paper that is actually winsomely written, uh, that doesn't have uh, the speed bumps uh, of, of poor grammar uh, or logical inconsistency. Um, when I have to stop and ask myself, why is sentence B following upon sentence A? That gets really in the way of, of reading a paper and appreciating a paper. Um, and when I write, I think to myself, it is my job uh, to lead the reader through my argument clearly. It is not the reader's job to figure out how all the pieces I'm throwing out there fit together. So, I guess in part being an ex-English major, in part being uh, a writer myself who thinks uh, extensively about how clearly my work is communicating, and rereads his own material, uh, boring as it may be, uh, and reworks it to make it as clear as possible, I, I want to see those same commitments uh, in, in the students whom I'm able to interact with. And then fourthly, and, and not least by any means, even though last, I am looking for an organic connection between your exegetical work and your application. What, uh, what does the text, on the basis of your study of it, your careful analysis of it, what does the text have to say about the formation of Christian discipleship and ministry that uh, can be helpful in your ministry context, in, in your congregational context, or, or however you wish to define that. Uh, and, and, and it's very important to me that the application not be a tack on that you could have written uh, without doing any exegesis in the first place. Uh, it's important to me that the application grow out of your reading and interpretation of the passage uh, attained by your exegetical work. Um, that's about a 45-minute orientation. I, I, I hate even in face-to-face -face classes to take more than that much time talking about <coughs> excuse me, 
overall uh, course goals and assignments and expectations and what have you. So I will bring this presentation to a close. And I would invite you, please, if you have any questions uh, or concerns about what you have heard in this, uh, in this presentation, uh, to email me. Um, and I will, I will respond to you with speed. And I may actually take your question or concern and respond to all the students involved if I think it might be uh, useful for them to hear that as well, uh, because I can think about what is necessary for you to hear, but I can't know that. You all know that at the end of any presentation, any lecture. So I, I will always welcome uh, your, your email comments um, uh, on these presentations saying, what about this? What about this? I heard this and it raises this concern. Uh, so that we can have some dialogue um, and so that these presentations can be as fruitful for you as possible. Thank you for signing up for this course. I find apocalyptic literature to be uh, actually remarkably challenging, helpful, uh, and formative uh, for, for Christian community, for Christian engagement with the larger world around us. Uh, it is this that has kept driving me back to Revelation. I'll be perfectly upfront. I'm not a Daniel scholar by any stretch, uh, but I think I have proven myself to be a scholar of Revelation and a scholar of the intertestamental period. Uh, and, and therefore, from those two angles, um, uh, competent also to deal with Daniel, uh, which I'm always digging into because of my work in Revelation, uh, and which seems like much more of an open book to me because of my work in the intertestamental period. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. Ah, yes. So questions that you have, comments that you have, concerns that you have uh, are, are all the more welcome uh, so that I can make sure uh, that these presentations, uh, what I have to offer here, um, are as helpful to you as, as possible. And I am personally interested in making sure that nothing you receive in this course um, hurts you uh, in terms of your faith commitment, your commitment to scripture, your, um, your um, engagement with scripture as an ongoing foundational resource for your own formation. So if that happens along the way, by all means, email me and let's work out that integration uh, uh, further together. Thank you so much and look forward to our interaction in the weeks ahead.